Uh, my name is Brian. If I don't know you, I'm the lead pastor here at Grace City. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, we're fully aware that it is crammed in here. And if you by any chance have like, I don't know, 5,000 square feet laying around anywhere in downtown Boston, we should talk afterwards and uh, we'll see if we can work something out. All right. Uh, we are uh, fully aware we're working on it. Uh, please be patient with us uh, as we just kind of uh, tend to um, work through the chaos of being a young, growing church. And so uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, just a couple of things kind of on the front end before we dive into uh, the, the particular topic that we're looking at this morning. Uh, we're, we're in a series talking about spiritual formation. And uh, in a, a part of that in what we've been talking about is talking about the various kind of resources that uh, we have found to be helpful for us kind of in this process. And so uh, we have uh, we've put together a resource page. So if you go to uh, GraceCityBoston.com, if you look in the top uh, right-hand corner, there's a button called uh, Resources. If you hit that, oh yeah, there it is on the screen. Um, if you hit that, uh, it, it kind of just has everything, um, books that we would recommend, uh, books that we've um, read uh, that have been formative for us as well. So there's everything from uh, formation uh, to Christian living, to apologetics, to theology, uh, just kind of across the whole spectrum. And so if you're like, hey, what, what's a good resource um, for this particular topic? Uh, it's probably going to be there on the page. And so we just wanted to put that together um, so that you have it. And then the second thing to let you know about, and Haley mentioned earlier, but inside of your worship uh, folder that you have is our 2022 uh, budget. And so most of you probably could care less about that. But if you have questions about that, uh, the two guys that are on that team uh, will be in the back afterwards. Uh, they'll they'll be the guys back there uh, fidgeting. So if you uh, have any questions in terms of all those kind of things, uh, they'll be in the back. Everyone go with that? Cool. We're in a, 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 a series entitled uh, Spiritual Formation. It's really a three-part series uh, that will lead us all the way up to um, Easter. And so the first part of uh, the spiritual formation kind of process of our church is we're looking at these things we call the habits. And so the habits are really one of three other things. So if you were looking at, I think we have the, the, the graph, there it is. If you were looking at kind of our process for um, spiritual formation, here's how we see it play out at Grace City. Um, so if I'm sitting down with you and I'm thinking, okay, is this person um, healthy? Is this, is this someone that is pursuing the way of Jesus? Is this someone, uh, or, or you're trying to assess like, hey, what areas in my life do I need to um, kind of find maturity and growth in? I'm looking at these three areas. So I'm looking at, are you practicing the habits? Uh, so this is uh, prayer, scripture reading, fasting, uh, Sabbath, silence, solitude, um, all of these kind of uh, traditional habits, maybe you call them disciplines, spiritual disciplines, practices, whatever you call them. Uh, we just call them habits because that's what they are. Uh, no need to like over-spiritualize it. They're habits that we practice as a people. Uh, the second thing I'm looking for is, is this person in community, like actual genuine community, not kind of faux community, not kind of like metaverse community, like actual genuine face-to-face mask to mask community right um and you're like i see your eyes and they're they're locked in so um it, it, are you in that or are you in a house church or are you in a core group or what is that looking like in your circle and then the kind of the third area is mission right are you um all of us have been gifted by god with with various gifts right scriptures talk about this all the time how are you using those gifts right in your vocation inside of a local church all those all those types of things so we're spending the next uh, couple of weeks uh, processing through these things. The, the question at the core of spiritual formation for all of us is, what type of person am I becoming? So not am I good at reading the scriptures, not am I consistent in my prayer life, not do I um, observe a Sabbath every week, although those are all very important questions. The most important question that you can be asking yourself is, what type of person am I becoming? What type of community, Grace City, what type of community are we becoming? This is the question that spiritual formation seeks to answer. Here's a definition for spiritual formation, just so you know where we're going. Uh, this is by a guy named Robert Mahalan. I think it's the cleanest uh, definition uh, that, that you can have. He says this, spiritual formation is a process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. So if you're, if you're looking at that definition, right, spiritual formation is a process right? So a slow process, it takes time of, of being formed, right? Of, of being made into what? What is the conclusion? Into the image of Jesus for the sake of others. So our end goal as a people 
in practicing spiritual formation is not so that um, you'll be a more moral person, although some of you should, right? It's not so that you would be uh, a more gracious person, although some of you should be, right? It's not that you, you should be someone who is more like full of joy, although all of us should be. Those are all important things that, that we should be, but at the kind of the base level, what spiritual formation um, is, is after is conformity to Christ. Am I looking more and more and more like Jesus every day? This is that's what we're going after. Okay, so today um, we're talking about uh, the habit of prayer, the habit of prayer. But I want to kind of say just on the front end, but because we're kind of in this, uh, we're in this kind of habit kind of idea and thought. Here's what I want to say. Uh, because my fear is, if your personality is anything like mine, uh, I gravitate towards something. I'm an eight on the Enneagram, if I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram, but I'm an eight on the Enneagram. So I'm a pretty intense individual uh, a lot of the time. That's just kind of where I'm at. I'm very excited about lots of things. I wing seven, which means I'm an enthusiast. So I'm a challenger. I wing seven. I'm an enthusiast. So when I get into something, I am all in, right? Max level. So if I'm hearing this, this series... I, this is what I, this is how I'm going to tend to interpret it. I'm going to think, man, I need to have the most robust, Holy Spirit-filled time with the Lord every day. Like I need a, I need a two, a good two to three hour space, which means I'm going to have to, okay, so I have a 10-year-old and a three-year-old. I'm going to have to wake up uh, around 5 a.m., you know, 4 a.m. maybe, and just spend this robust kind of just space with the Lord, right? I don't know, maybe some of you are wired that way. Here's what I want to say to you. I want to like calm your nerves. Um, do you know the saying, the, the heaviest weight at the gym is the door? Do you know that saying? Like the heaviest weight at any gym is the front door. Now, what's the basis behind that? It's just simply saying, hey, the, the, it, it's really the practice and the work of going to the gym that's the most work. All, all I'm asking is we're talking about prayer and Sabbath and uh, scripture reading is that you just start. That you just start. It, it's much better for you to do less than what you shot for than to not do anything at all. So, so I'm not expecting to, to come out of this and you to have this kind of, you know, talking about prayer today and you have like a, a just incredible robust, robust kind of prayer life. It just doesn't usually go that way. Uh, it usually takes time. Practice, not performance, is really how you dial into the habits. It's consistency, not intensity, that brings about formation, right? It's repetition. Uh, it, formation is all about repetition, about practicing these things over and over and over again. Okay, so let's talk about the habit of prayer. Uh, let's get into it. I'm gonna pray and then we'll dive in. God, we thank you for, um, God, we just acknowledge your presence here this morning. God, thank you that you speak to us uh, through song, through prayer, um, through your word, God. And so as we look at your word this morning, as we seek to embrace this thing that um, you have given to us for our good, uh, would you help us, God? We, we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, would do the work of illumination this morning, um, that, that we would be more and more and more conformed into the image of Jesus, God, that we would look more and more like your sons and daughters. This is, this is our request this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I'm not sure there's anything more confusing or difficult for people uh, than prayer. Like if we were to go around the room and I was to ask you about your definition of prayer or your particular prayer life, uh, that we would probably be all over the place, all, kind of all over the spectrum in terms of our understanding of why we do it, how we do it, uh, what is it like when we're doing it. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, he's a pastor, said this about the confusion around prayer. He said, of all the activities in which the Christian engages and which are a part of the Christian life, there is surely none which causes so much perplexity and raises so many problems as the activity which we call uh, prayer. It's fascinating. It's something that all of us probably are confused about, while at the same time, all of us probably do in some form or another. The writer, uh, literary writer Anne Lamont, says her two favorite prayers are thanks, 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 and help, help, help. I was listening to uh, Dave Grohl's autobiography, The Storyteller, who's the lead singer of Foo Fighters, and um, 
it was fascinating. I was listening this past week, and uh, there, there's a moment in in his book where he he would attribute his success as a musician. He's very successful. He would attribute this moment of prayer to his success. So I'm just listening to this. Really fascinating. And he's not praying to the Christian God. Uh, he's not praying to really God in general. If you listen to it, he's basically just kind of praying to the universe, almost seeking to kind of manifest something. But there's something hardwired in all people that finds itself in prayer, that finds itself um, uh, praying and seeking out prayer to someone. There was a Princeton uh, um, uh, doctrinal student, and uh, here was his question. He said, what is there in the world left for an original dissertation research to which Albert Einstein said, Albert Einstein, find out about prayer. Someone must find out about prayer. According to uh, Gallup Poll's research group, it says more Americans will pray this week than will exercise, drive a car, have sex, or go to work. Chances are you found yourself in a situation where you have um, leaned into prayer, whether out of a place of confusion or sadness or joy or difficulty, you've leaned into it. Even the enemies of the way of Jesus, this is fascinating. So in the Soviet Union in the days of Stalin, like even the enemies of the way of Jesus understand the power of prayer. Listen to what they would do. Uh, so, so teachers um, in, in uh, Stalin's day in the Soviet Union, they would tell kids, elementary kids, to close their eyes and pray to God for a bag of candy. And so the kids would close their eyes. They would pray to God for a bag of candy. And miraculously, a bag would was in a revival. No, that's not what happened, right? So they would close their eyes. They would pray. The teacher would instruct them to open their eyes. And what would happen? Nothing. Nothing would happen. Then the teacher would instruct the kids, and they would say, okay, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to pray to Stalin for a bag of candy. So the kids would close their eyes. They would pray to Stalin for a bag of candy. The teacher would walk around the classroom, drop a bag of candy on all the kids' desk, instruct them to open their eyes, and would tell the kids, see, when you pray to Stalin, he brings you candy. See, see there, there's something like deeply wired um, in people that we kind of grasp, whether we agree with it or not, whether we, we see it as a, a thing that we would say uh, a, a Christian God kind of standpoint, we recognize the power of prayer. There's something unique about it. Just, just think about the reasons why people pray. Let's talk about just general prayer, right? Uh, we pray to express thankfulness or gratitude, right? So the universe did this. Like, I'm, I'm just, I just need to express gratitude, Right? Maybe you have a friend that's that way who's not a Christian, or maybe you're that way, and, and you're just like, man, I, I need to thank someone out there who did this. We pray to express anger or frustration, right? Who, who let this happen? Who, who's to blame? We pray to express weakness. If anyone's out there, are you listening? Is anyone out there? Do you hear me? Is anyone out there? All of these things are ways of praying. Uh, Jesus, if you study the gospel accounts, uh, so Jesus had men and women who were following him uh, throughout his ministry. And so these were, these were uh, just leaders in the ministry of Jesus. And so they were interacting with him. They were seeing him do incredible things. If you've read any of the gospel accounts, you've kind of seen this yourself. They've seen Jesus heal people. They saw Jesus uh, talk about and teach about the kingdom of God. Uh, they saw Jesus uh, embrace the marginalized right? They saw uh, Jesus uplift women. They, they, say, they kind of saw all of these things that Jesus was doing. And so there's this one really uh, fascinating encounter where they essentially come to Jesus, and this is what they say to him. This is like the one request that they have in terms of teaching them. They say to Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? So think about that for a moment. The one thing that the disciples ask of Jesus is what? How to pray. They don't say, will you teach us how to cast out demons? Will you uh, teach us how to do miracles? Will you teach us how to uh, understand the kingdom of God? In the scriptures, they just say to Jesus, will you teach us to pray? Apparently, there was something about the life of Jesus that lended itself towards the early followers of Jesus asking about what? His prayer life. They saw him. They were in close proximity to him. And they said to him, Teach us how to pray. From this request um, of the disciples, we get this, uh, this beautiful kind of Lord's, 
Lord's Prayer, right? That that every athletic team forever has been repeating, right? <laughs> when I was in, uh, this this has nothing to do with anything, but when I was in middle school, no, high school, I had a soccer team and we would always, uh, we'd always do the Lord's Prayer at the beginning. Uh, or I didn't go to, I went, didn't, wasn't at a Christian school or anything. I don't my coach, I don't even know. And it's always like this. This is always the funniest thing. This really has nothing to do with it, but I think it's funny. Uh, we'd be like this. I knew it um, because I was in church at that point in my life, but it would be like this. Okay, guys, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. I'm like, Our Father, who art in heaven, you know, like the further it got in, it's the worse it got. Okay. So, um, so, so, Jesus and his, or even his earliest followers are saying, hey, we, we need to know how to pray. Uh, there, there's another, um, uh, there's another uh, incredible experience where uh, Jesus um, is going into the temple, the, the Jewish temple. And um, it, it's an incredible story about Jesus coming in. And essentially what was happening uh, in the temple is they uh, were taking advantage of people. They were uh, abusing the marginalized. You had people that were collecting money and, and just essentially... Um, doing inside of God's temple what they should not be doing, uh, taking advantage of people. And so the story, uh, Jesus um, comes in, this is in Matthew uh, 21, uh, specifically in verse 13. Jesus comes in, begins turning over tables. He's uh, kind of throwing the money launderers out, uh, these money lenders. They're kind of throwing all these out. And here's the interesting thing that Jesus says. He's quoting uh, Isaiah 56. He He instructs him to get out and he says, my house will be a house of what? A house of prayer, not not a house of worship, uh, not a house of teaching, but a house of prayer. This is what um, my house uh, will be. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, this is what the writer of Hebrews says um, about Jesus. This is incredible. Um, so the writer calls Jesus our high priest. And then verse 24 says this, but because he remains forever, Jesus... He holds his priesthood permanently, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he 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 always lives to intercede for them. See, the writer of Hebrews actually says that after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he's actually praying for you forever to the Father. He's interceding on your behalf, on my behalf, that if you're in Christ, we have one that is praying and interceding on our behalf. Okay, a couple of barriers to develop. So here's what we're going to do. I'll talk about a couple of barriers to developing a habit of prayer and then why we should uh, develop a habit of prayer, and then we'll be done. So four things, barriers to developing a habit of prayer. Uh, Here's the first one. Uh, A lot of people believe prayer is primarily reactive. So it's just something that you do in response to something that has already happened. So why in the world would you develop a habit of prayer if prayer is just reactive? It's not proactive. So someone's sick or something um, has gone wrong, now I will pray. It's a barrier to developing a habit of prayer. The second thing, they believe prayer isn't necessary. If God already knows all things, why do we pray? Why don't you develop a habit of prayer if God already knows? We'll talk about that further down when we get into the why. Thirdly, they believe prayer is is too spiritual. So some people are like, listen, it's not my wiring. It's not who I am. Like, I get what you're saying. I understand you've made a case that Jesus is for prayer and that, that that's a really important thing, but that's just not me, man. That's more like the, more for the spiritual uh, elite, you know, the religious elite. Like, that's just not something that I do. I'm just not wired that way. It's not who I am. Fourthly, um, so believe prayer is primarily reactive, believe prayer isn't necessary, believe prayer is too spiritual. Fourthly, uh, a lot of people don't develop, and I think this is the saddest one, a lot of people don't develop a habit of prayer because they believe they're unqualified to come before God. Uh, Dave Ford, he, David Ford was a professor in Cambridge. Uh, he asked a Catholic priest the most common problem that he encountered in 20 years of hearing confession. So he said, hey, what's the the main problem that you experience in confession with other people? The priest, with no hesitation, with no hesitation, replied, God. He went on to say that that very few of his, uh, um, very few of the, his congregation uh, that meets in confession believe as if God is a God of love or forgiveness or gentleness or compassion 
they see God as someone to cower before, not as someone like Jesus, not worthy of our trust. Uh, Ford goes on in, in comments. He says, this is perhaps the hardest truth of any to grasp. Do we wake up every morning amazed that we're loved by God? Do we allow our day to be shaped by God's desire to relate to us? See, it, it, the, the barrier to a habit of prayer is that you think, oh, man, I'm like, do you know what my life's like? Do you know what I did last night? Like, do you know what my thoughts are? How I continually stumble? Like, God doesn't, I'm not qualified to come before God. God would squash me. God doesn't want to hear from me. God's not interested in, in the things that are going on in my life. And that, that's actually the, the opposite of Scripture. Like, if, if you're someone in Christ, you have access to God the Father. You have grace forever. He's a merciful God forever. And it's actually the proximity to God that brings you to health, not proximity away from Him that brings you to health. And so a habit of prayer is an acknowledgement before God that he's a gracious God because none of us are perfect and none of us will be. We're all kind of stumbling through um, stumbling through this process. Okay, so why is developing a habit of prayer important? A uh, couple of things here and, uh, and then we'll, we'll close out. Here, here's three things. Now, the first reason why developing a habit of prayer is important is it's a weapon against earthly troubles, a weapon against earthly troubles. Paul says this, Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7, uh, he says this, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I cannot tell you uh, the amount of times I've leaned into this verse when anxiety just seems to come over me. Like, I, I, uh, honestly, as I've gotten older, I feel like I've become a more anxious individual. I think maybe because when I was younger, I was like, everything's good. Everything's all right. You know, just got to push it all deep. Uh, within my therapist, we're working on it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've just simply leaned to this verse of Paul just saying, hey, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Like it's actually a weapon against your anxiety. It's a, it's a weapon against, uh, prayer is a weapon against the, the kind of worldly assault that comes on you, the kind of cultural assault that we experience. Like we need a habit of prayer to fight against these things. These things help us. Henry Nowen says this, he's a, um, a spiritual writer. Uh, I love this quote. He says, in a situation in which the world is threatened by annihilation, prayer does not mean much when we undertake it only as an attempt to influence God or as a search for spiritual or a search for a spiritual fallout shelter or as an offering of comfort in stress-filled times. Prayer is the act by which we divest ourselves of all false belongings and become free to belong to God and God alone. Philip Yancey says this, anytime I can get in a Philip Yancey quote in my sermons, I will. Here's what he says about prayer. He says, prayer allows me to admit my failures, weaknesses, and limitations to one who responds to human vulnerability with infinite mercy. I love that. That, that prayer is a space where we admit our failures, our weaknesses, and limitations to one who actually responds to human vulnerability with infinite grace. See, it's a weapon. It's a weapon against the assault of the world. Second thing that, that why we should develop a habit of prayer is it aligns us with the kingdom of God. It aligns us with the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 9 and 10, this is how Jesus began his prayer. He's there, he says, therefore, you should pray like this. He was talking about the hypocrites who were praying out loud and were doing it for show. So he says, don't pray like them. He says, pray like this. Our Father, right? Our, plural, our Father. Collectively, we have a Father. And then he says, where is he? He's in heaven. So our Father in heaven, who's seated on a throne in heaven above us, says, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your name be set apart. It's his kingdom aligning. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what prayer does. It aligns us with the kingdom of God. Here's what I do every morning. Let me just be super, uh, just be very personal this morning. 
every morning I get up and I pray what I essentially what I call a kingdom aligning prayer. And here's what I do. So I wake up in the morning. Uh, I set a timer. You're like, that sounds like so unspiritual. Well, that's what I do. I set a timer, started with five minutes. It's slowly, it's getting, fr- like, it was interesting is the longer, um, longer I get into practicing the habit of prayer, the more I seem to enjoy it, the more time I need. So I set this prayer and here, here's what I do. It's kingdom line. So uh, I put my feet flat. I'm sitting down. I put my feet flat on the ground. I uh, open palms up every morning. And this is what I pray. First thing is I say to God, I say, God, I recognize this. I'm not asking him for anything. I'm just saying, to him, hey, God, I recognize while I slept, you were holding all things together. God, I recognize that while I was sleeping because I needed to, that you were in relationship with people all across the world. God, that while I slept, you were creating miracles. God, while I was sleeping, you were convicting people. God, while I was asleep, you were present with your people. God, I just recognize that this morning. Second thing that I say is I say, God, I recognize that um, what I see in part, you see in full. God, that my vision is relatively small compared to yours. Like I just, I see that, God. I see that you see the whole, what I see in part. That I can see in front of me, but you see in front, you see behind, you see it all, God. I just recognize that this morning. Thirdly, again, kingdom aligning prayer. I say to God, God, I, this morning, I admit that I'm prone towards anxiety. God, I'm prone towards sin. I'm prone towards laziness and greed. God, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to, to, to be a sinful person and you are not. This morning, I just recognize you're not, God. You're not. And then this is how I end it. This is how I end it. God, in light of all of these things, today I submit myself to you. In light of these things, I submit myself to you today. See that? Just kingdom aligning prayer. I, I cannot I can't begin to tell you that that just that simple little five minute prayer, how it's changed things for me in my day, how I'm interacting. Okay, third thing. Uh, so it aligns us with the kingdom of God. Here's the third thing. Uh, I, I don't know any other way to say this. The reason we should develop a habit of prayer is because Jesus prioritized it. The gospels, the gospels record over a dozen specific prayers of Jesus, along with several parables and teachings on the subject. Uh, he followed the normal Jewish practice of visiting the synagogue, the house of prayer. He prayed at least three times a day. Uh, we can safely assume that he prayed in private because when his disciples um, asked to teach him how to pray, he said they should so, uh, seclude themselves. They should go away to a place. Uh, Luke records in Luke 5. 15 and 16, he says, the crowds were pressing down on Jesus. They were pressing upon him. Uh, and then it says this, that um, after he had come together, he the, to, he had healed the sick, healed, heard them, all these things. It says, yet he often, he often withdrew to a deserted place and prayed. Jesus, think about this. As Jesus approached a Roman execution as an innocent man, as Jesus approached uh, his conviction, his beating, his humiliation, and was walking to the cross, the most difficult part of his journey in life, what, think about it, what was Jesus doing? Was he rallying the troops? Was he calling, calling everyone to arms? Was he gathered with his family and giving them some last instructions because he knows he's about to get arrested? What is he doing? He's doing what? He's praying. This is the last recorded thing that we have that Jesus is doing before he is arrested. He's praying. You, you can see this in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. He, he brings actually some friends with him, asks them to pray for him. And if you know the story, they keep falling asleep over and over and over again. And Jesus just saying to them, won't you pray with me? I'm, I'm, I'm headed to the cross. Like, won't you pray with me? See, Jesus prioritized it. 
here's why. If you don't hear anything else, just hear this. Um, and I'm going to just one, a couple of practical things and, and we'll be it. We, we as a people, we can't say prayer isn't necessary or doesn't work. Like to say that it's not necessary or doesn't work would say that Jesus is delusional. When you make a statement about prayer that is incorrect, you make a statement about Jesus. If we're following the way of Jesus, then prayer was actually something that he embraced. A couple of practical things here. Three things. To develop a habit of prayer, we have to normalize boredom. You're like, what, did he say that correctly? Yes. You have to normalize boredom, right? Like so you, sometimes you get into it and you're like, God, thank you so much for this day. This was, uh, you're like, Pfft. all right. Um, where do I go from here? Right? Th this is just it. Like prayer, like it, again, it's not this thing where you're just overwhelmed by the spirit. Like that happens. I think you can develop into that, but you got to normalize boredom and just be okay with it. Don't pull out your phone, right? You don't have to cut on music if you're doing silent prayer. Just normalize boredom. Second thing, you have to reframe distractions. Thomas Keating said this, if you get distracted 10,000 times in prayer, that is 10,000 opportunities to return to God. So you're in prayer, you get distracted as we do. You're like, oh, God, sorry, coming back. I'm back with you. You get distracted again. Oh, God, I'm back. I'm back with you now. It's just another opportunity for you to come back to God, normalize boredom, reframe distractions. Thirdly, you have to utilize different strategies. I'll just read through these. Uh, you can journal your prayers. You can read others' um, written prayers already. You can set a timer, which is what I do, which is super helpful. You can pray with others. You can pray the scriptures. That's primarily what we do in the prayer room. We have scriptures. We pray through the scriptures together on Wednesday mornings. You can do that. You can set alarms for different topics. So at 10.02 every day, I get an alarm on my phone that's a topic to pray for. Every Monday at 10.02, I get an alarm that says, pray for your family. And you're like, that sounds crazy unspiritual. Like, it's just unbelievable unspiritual to me. How's your prayer life? Because I'm praying at 10 2 every day. You want to go? Right? This is what we're doing. Again, we talk about this. This is just habits. Repetition. 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 Forming in us. Right? Working. Again, working from a place of security. Right? We're doing this from a place of security in Jesus. Not so that we're secure, but from a secure place. We are fully sons and daughters of Jesus. We don't do these things so God would love us more. We do these things so that we look more like Jesus, more and more conformed into his image. You can pray out loud with others. I have a prayer um, method that, that maybe is helpful. You may have heard it before. It's called the ACTS prayer um, acronym. You can throw that up, Cohen. Um, it's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Maybe you've seen this before. Uh, adoration is recognizing God for who he is. Confession is recognizing yourself for who you are. Thanksgiving is recognizing that all things come from God. And supplication is recognizing that God is able to meet your needs and wants. You can just pray this. You can go in this order. That works. You're like, I'm very interested in supplication. I get that. But maybe let's start with adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. Supplication.